What up, world? It's your boss, Kamal Nuru. So Mega Millions. Wow. The blade to your fade, the ends to your bends, and the cheers to your shits. You are now watching Barber World TV, the podcast. What's up, world? It's your boss, Kamal Nuru, a.k.a. Zo Mega Millions, a.k.a. Passport Zo. <laughs> I'm here, episode 29, I'm with my brother, one of the shining stars of Levels, my man Lonnie, a.k.a. Edward Scissorhands. What's good, brother? Welcome to the show. Oh, man, everything's good, man. Thanks for having me, man. I'm down here in Bobble World TV with my man Zo Zega, uh, Mega Millions, man. Everything is good here, man. Lonnie, tell the audience where you're from. I'm from uh, Brooklyn, New York, Fabricant Projects. Fabricant Projects. I wanted to have Lonnie down here for a particular reason. His, his story is unique, and um, I think if, if he can do it, other barbers can do it. And he's lived what I've been trying to tell barbers for years. He's living proof that if you apply yourself, you could be great in this game. So um, you're from Brooklyn, Fabricate Projects. Um, tell us, we, we're going to start slow from the beginning. Where did you go to school? I went to uh, high school, Alexander Hamilton in um, Brooklyn, Crown Heights. Then I went to uh, Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. Okay, so this is a brother that went to college. You know what I'm saying? Um, what did you do in high school? Did you play sports? Well, you know. Yeah, I played uh, varsity basketball. Mm -hmm. I didn't start. You know, I came off the bench. And then um, I went to Shaw University because that was my college coach alma mater. Okay. So I kind of followed, you know, his his footsteps. Right. Um, when you went to Shore University, did you play ball or would you just went for academics? Well, um, I actually went for academics first, but then I tried out and I, I walked on and got a spot. Okay, what position you play? God, shooting God. Shooting God, okay. <laughs> well, we have our little levels. Uh, we used to have that every year that each shop plays, each shop, you yeah. know what I mean? Um, Brooklyn won. Brooklyn won one year, they, but they they cheated one year. They they got all the young kids from um, Bishop Lachlan. And, you know, none of the barbers played for right. Brooklyn. They got the whole Bishop Lachlan team, and they ragged everybody. They ragged all the old timers. You know what I'm saying? Right. Okay. So what did you, what else did you do growing up in in Brooklyn? Now, because you you grew up in in the seventies and the eighties, and things was a little bit different back then. Correct. Oh, oh yes, yes, much much different. <laughs> Um, I grew up in Farragut and um, took on a, a side hustle, started hustling, mm -hmm. you know, and um, that kind of consumed me for the next 18 years of my life. 18 years. So from, when you say hustling, what did you hustle? I hustle weed mm -hmm. and I hustle crack. You hustle weed, you hustle crack. Um, why, how and why did you get into that? In, into that field, what it, what 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 drew drew you to that field? Well, coming up in Farragut, you know, in in, in the in the, um eighties, late seventies, late seventies, eight beginning of the eighties, um families were struggling. Mm -hmm. So um, out come out this new drug that had everybody going crazy. So you know, you seen the money that you could make from it instantly. So that was the law into getting to the drug game. Mm -hmm. And tell us about your family dynamic, like how many siblings you had and so on. Well, I have um I had four brothers. I had a sister. I lost a sister and I lost a brother. So now it was just um two brothers remaining, myself, mm -hmm. right. my mom, my father passed away. Mm -hmm. And you know. So to be more specific, I don't know if you can get uh give up this information. Like how did you literally get into selling crack you know like what what's how did you know okay you saw people making money and so what steps did you go from there like you know because i saw people making money too but i never took that step towards that you know what i mean right well what happened was you know you out there you seeing other people hustling and you seeing all the money that they're making and how easy it, it seemed to appear in the beginning because all you know is sell money. You don't know everything else that come with it because you're kind of blind to the game because you knew. Right. So what happened was uh, a, a female I was dating in high school, her brother was in the drug game and he wound up getting incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So his kid's mother knew that I hung up, hang out, hung up, excuse me, 
I, I, I used to hang out uh-huh. in front of a particular building that a lot of drug sales was taking place. Uh, and why did you hang out in front of that building? Because that's where I was from. Okay. Okay. Right? So um, one day she saw me, I saw her, and uh, she had told me that her you know, kid's father got locked up and she had this stuff. And I said, you know what? Give it to me. And that was the beginning wow. of my So it was career. almost like fate, almost like, because did you see yourself pursuing it before that? Because that kind of like fell in your lap. No. I didn't right. see myself pursuing it. Mm-hmm. It was just that an opportunity had came right. about me able to get it because honestly, I didn't know where to start. Cop, how to start, right, how to right. start. I just seen people doing it. I was young, right. so when it was basically put in my hand, that was the beginning of my Your connect. Career. So was it cocaine that was put in your hand, or was it already crack? Yeah, it was already crack. Okay, it was already crack. Okay, right. so. You get it, you sell it. What happens next? And well, how old are you at this time? I'm 16. Wow, he's no. Yeah, I get it, I sell it instantly. <laughs> it's gone. Is it because it sold itself or is it because also you're a good salesman? Well, I'll say a little bit of both. Okay. But it was just that at that particular time, it was rampant. Like, mm-hmm. like people wasn't used to smoking crack. So right. as soon as they smoked it, it was instant hooked, mm-hmm. and um, the money was just incredible. So I was hooked just like they was hooked. Right. So how did you re-up? Did you re-up with the money you made from it? Did you give her some of the money? Like, how? what happened? Well, once I finished, I gave her the money that she asked for, and right. I had made some money for myself. Right. But she wasn't into the streets neither. It was the baby father that was into the streets. Okay. So now I had to search around and ask different people, how to get on. A connect. I had to get it, find a connect. Right. Now, that was kind of hard because, hey, I'm this young guy. I got me a couple hundred dollars, and I'm trying to buy me some work. Mm-hmm. Now, you got the people that's trying to take your money and give you garbage. You got people that's trying to work you. You know, it's, it was just crazy. So I went through my couple of phases of trusting this person they giving you stuff, but they're not giving you what you're really supposed to get because they're beating you too. So you, you don't gotta, know any better. You don't know beginning. no better. Mm-hmm. So you learn in the game as you go on. Mm-hmm. So that's how you you know you 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 learn how to become a hustler because right. you know, trial and error. And how long is this Farragut projects that you're selling? Yeah, at, okay. at this time, um, I hustled in Farragut um, from 16 years old to I'll say 18 because I left to go to college. Okay, so. You're hustling, but you're still going to school. Yes, you're graduating with the college. Yes, so are you yes. hustling after school or? I'm hustling before school. Okay, and I'm hustling when I get off of school, and I'm hustling the whole weekend. Wow. It, 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 it it consumed <laughs> me because the money was so so fast, it, you right. know, so so coming so fast that it just consumed me. Okay, so you graduate, you go off to college, right? Yes. Do you bring the or do you have to find another connect? No. When I graduate um, from high school- now What year is this? This is 1985. 1985. When I graduate from high school and I go to college, the last thing on my mind is hustling mm-hmm. down in North Carolina. Right. Now, what I was still doing for a minute was flying back to New York on the weekend, <laughs> making my couple dollars, and going back to college. Well, you was really committed to that paper. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was going back to college. Right. And then what happened was, um, being in North Carolina, you start meeting people, and then you start telling your war stories about how you was getting money and this and that, and then one person says one thing, and you say, what? You got a spot? Now you start bringing your stuff from New York to North Carolina. So they didn't have any, they didn't have connects in North Carolina. They had very limited connects. Right, right. So now New York had the better price, the cheaper price. Mm -hmm. By the time it hit North Carolina, they was jacking the price up. Mm -hmm. So they had a straight plug, which became me, to bring it right from New York to North Carolina. Now, when you was bringing it, was you bringing crack or was you bringing cocaine? um, I was bringing both at that time because um, if you couldn't get the crack, you could buy the coke. And then down in North Carolina, they was crafty. Them people know how to cook up amazingly. So Mm -hmm. it didn't matter what you brung back. Wow. So is it like an art and science to the cooking? Yeah, it is. It is. Can anybody do it or are there certain people that does it so well you want them to do it? Right. 
like me myself, you're not a chef. I'm not a chef. No. Uh-huh. So, <laughs> and then when you buying the powder and trusting somebody to cook it up for you, they still could be beating you too. Right. Right. So my whole thing, I just totally went crack. This way, I know that I wasn't getting beat. Okay. Okay. So you're down in North Carolina. You're going to school. And you're hustling now. What year is this about? This is first year, second year? This is um, my first year. I'm still going back and forth to New York. Okay. I'll say six months into my freshman year, Mm. I'm not doing New York no more. I don't met my connect, my my little people in North Carolina, Mm -hmm. and I'm swinging and I'm giving them stuff in North Carolina. So you the middleman? Yes. Okay. And you're going to school. So how is life, you making, usually when you're in college, you kind of poor. Right, you know what I'm saying. So, uh, are, are you making enough money to buy a car now, or like what's going on? Well, back then, um, I already had a car. I left from New York with a car that right. I hustled up for the summer because knew I was what, going. What to kind college. of car was? I this? had a Toyota Corolla. Okay, Toyota Corolla. Yeah, that's like a you know entry level right. vehicle. Right, Toyota Corolla. Okay. Yeah, back then it was hot with yeah. the blob pump and everything inside. It was, okay, it was hot. So, um, I'm down there. Now, like I said, I totally left New York alone, mm-hmm. and I'm just hustling North Carolina, and I'm kind of trifling my profit. So my gear's up, my money's up. You know, what now about the girls. Oh, that's you know, that that's what I question. With it. <laughs> my girl game is up, uh-huh. but now I start shifting from school and basketball to treating college like I'm in New York. Mm-hmm. I'm posting up on the side of the building. I got my work stash. I got people coming from out of the out of the town, coming to the campus to buy drugs. I mean, it just, it just went totally out of control. Now, with all this going on, did someone tell on you? Did you have to move it away from the college? Like, what happened? Well, um, it was other individuals that I went to college with that they started hustling too, and it was like a crew of us. And um, before you know it, um, North Carolina has. Like, we got the FBI, they got the SBI, that's the State Bureau okay. of Investigations. Okay. By this time, I'm living off, I, I still got a room on campus, but I'm living off campus. Okay. And why one of the nights where I'm not on campus, they raid our rooms. And you happen to not be there. I happen to not be there. <laughs> but when they raid the room, all they find is a scale, because we don't keep the work in the room. Right. But by then, we know they on to us. Okay. So being that um, this is now actually this is past my freshman year because okay. we down there two or three years, okay, rocking and rolling, okay. So the crew I had, our name was just getting crazy, right? The other guys were they from New York as well? Yeah, you okay. had you had dudes from Brooklyn, you had dudes from the Bronx, you had dudes from Detroit. We all just had the same goal in mind mm-hmm. of getting money. Okay. So we kind of got our work. From another dude who was coming right. down from New York, right? And we was all college friends, so it kind of branched off where we were sitting all the different areas. Right. So our names got out there. We in the club. We shining. North Carolina. Yeah, in Raleigh, Raleigh, Raleigh. 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 So okay. we doing our thing. So um, by the third year, when the SBI raided our rooms, the college came to the conclusion that we was giving the school a bad name, mm-hmm. and they kicked us all out. Okay. And once they kicked us out, from there, it was just no return for me. I just went knee deep into the drug game. Now, did you remain in North Carolina? Yes. And, okay. I, re- I remained in North Carolina for an additional two years. Mm-hmm. By then, I don't incorporated my brother. He came down because mm-hmm. he kept seeing me coming back from New York, ringing up, looking good with money. He came down. His man came down. Before you know it, it was just... It was crazy. Brooklyn's in the house. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now we're talking about maybe 89, 90? Yes. So by this time, what you driving, what you wearing, like, how, well, how, how's your lifestyle? Well, back point? then, we was more rental cars. Okay. You know what I mean? Back and forth to New York. Mm-hmm. See, because we were still in the mind, and I can speak for myself, we were still kind of uh, infants in the game. Right. We just seen the glo- We just seen the, the glitz and the glamour. Mm-hmm. We seen the you know the, the jewelry. We seen the clothes. We seen the woman. We seen the ability to travel here, go here, and just outdo the average college person. Right. Now um, we were still young. Right. You know, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. So it wasn't uh, certain individuals had cars, but you mm-hmm. know, in North Carolina, that made you hot. 
Right, okay. So okay. the flashy cars was just a gateway for them to be on to you. Right. So what we constantly did was just switch up rental cars. Right. You right. know what I mean? So we kind of try to keep everything low profile. On, on the low profile. Mm-hmm. You know what I mm-hmm. mean? So at some point, you get into some trouble. And tell me how that happens. Well, um, from North Carolina, like I said, our names got out there. Mm-hmm. Things got out of control. Uh, one of the guys that um, came down, one of the guys that was in the crew, he got murdered. So things is starting to get real, real, for real. Whereas right. we took it as it was just a game. Right. We didn't know the serious. We we, we young. We don't right. know the seriousness about what we really into. It's spiraling out of control. It's, it's out and of control. Did he get murdered because of? He get the- it murdered because one of the guys that I hung out with had gave him some some work. Okay. And he felt like the guy was playing him, so he never paid the guy. Mm-hmm. But he had it all intentions of paying the guy. He was just trying to prove a point. Right. But being that we didn't really know the seriousness of what could happen behind this game, mm-hmm. he gets killed. Wow. Because the guy has to show that, listen, he, he you no got problem. my stuff, you ain't paying, I got to make an example out of you. Mm. And by then, it's just, now you know. You in trouble, right? So then, what happens? Um, from there, um, everybody just went their own separate way, mm-hmm. and then I kind of branched off on my own, and I still played North Carolina for a minute, and then um, I kind of had enough of North Carolina, and I migrated to Wilmington, Delaware. I, I, I ran into a guy when I was reading up in Harlem, and he said, "Yo, I got a spot in Delaware." Mm-hmm. I grew up with him. I could say he was my best friend at the time. I go to Wilmington, Delaware. Okay. I started hustling in Delaware. That was good for a minute. Before you know it, things get ugly there. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So you're constantly moving because you can't stay in these places too long. And make money without there without being problem. some conflict. Right. And, right. and honestly... I wasn't really into the gunplay, even though it was certain situations where you're back against the wall, you had to do what you had to do. Right. But my whole thing was, I'm a hustler. Right. I'm not a murderer. You're not with the murder game. Right. With the hustle game. Right. Mm-hmm. So I've always used my mind to make my money to outsmart the next person. Right. Okay. So from Delaware, then what happens? From Delaware, um, my brother, he's still in North Carolina that I brung down there. Mm-hmm. He get into some get into uh, some beef with some New York dudes. Uh, they wind up killing a New York dude. He goes to jail. I'm in Delaware. The same guys that he killed, one of the guys he killed from New York, they crew is in Delaware. Uh. So I don't find out to after the fact mm-hmm. that they knew that I was my brother. Right. The same guy who brought me there, he started getting high. Wow. So. He drifted to the left, so I was basically out there on my own. Mm-hmm. Then I had another guy that was originally with me from North Carolina come to Delaware with me. We had a fallout. It was always just something going on. Right. So when I found out that um, they knew that my brother killed a friend, mm-hmm. they was trying to line me up. Uh. So a girl who was with their crew who knew I was a good dude pulled my coat. Mm-hmm. And said, you got to get out of here. Mm-hmm. They know that's your brother. They trying to line you up. Right. So from Delaware, I jumps in the cab, goes to Amtrak. I goes to D.C. because I got a kid, mm-hmm. a newborn in D.C. Uh-huh. And I gets to D.C., no attentions of hustling, playing ball. Dudes just you know, paying me to play ball, this and that, and everything is good. So you know, it's the war stories. I start telling, talking to one of the hustlers. and. Right. I'm telling him my past, what I've been through. He the man on the block and this and that. And he's like, look, if you want to get some money, man, I stamp your name and you can start rocking right here. Mm. I'm like, nah, I'm good. Blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm I don't really know these dudes from DC. Right. But and that it that sometime New York and DC, it was hot right. down there because of the whole Alpo thing right. and all that. Right. Correct? And I have to I, I actually landed. A block from where he used to be at. Mm. So they was already fed up with New York dudes coming to DC. Right. And I remember one day I started hustling. They let me in. They one of the guys 
so-called one of the thug guys came down and said, listen, we know how you New York dudes do. We let one in. Before you know it, y'all bring a whole crew. He said, yo, even though we accepted you, do not bring nobody else down here from New York. Okay, cool. I get in. What I do, I bring somebody down from New York. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> I mean, and I kind of took over. Mm-hmm. But the guy that I brung down, he wasn't really on murder time. Now, it push come to shove, he would handle his business. But I already explained to him, yo, we got to be cool. We're going to play like we cousins because they're not playing the friend stuff. Right. So you my family, that's how we're going to carry it. Right. Got down in D.C., uh, rocked out for um, five years. Mm-hmm. Um, besides like little things you hear, never really had no problem mm-hmm. to towards the end. I guess dudes had enough of the New York dudes being in D.C. and stuff like that. Right. And um, Around what year is this now? This is... Um, 98. 98, okay. Yeah, I'm down there for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, dudes are fed up with, you know, dudes from New York coming down, getting money and stuff like that. And um, I remember one night, dude, he wanted to cop from me. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't have no stuff. So I said, listen, I got to go handle my business. When I come back, I'm going to take care of you. Right. Come back. Meet up with the dudes. All along, they were setting me up. Mm. I get in the car. First mistake, never get in nobody's car. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And um, I got in their car. I think it's going to be a simple transaction. And they wind up kidnapping me mm. and um, taking me to an alley in the same area where I was familiar with. So mm-hmm. honestly, it might sound crazy, but I kind of knew I was going to survive because uh-huh. I felt like I knew the area. Mm-hmm. Now, how they had brought me somewhere else... Right. Where I wasn't f- familiar with, right. maybe I would have thought differently. But so when you get in the car, they put the guns on. You. Yes, we get in the car, they pull the gun out of me. But I had just finished smoking weed, uh-huh. so I'm thinking when I hear a click, everybody know distinctive sign of a trigger being pulled back. Right. So it didn't hit me right away. Mm-hmm. I'm just thinking they just showing me guns. Right. And when they said we got your New York ASS, ass, right? You could curse on yeah, the podcast. Yeah, you know, you uh, got your New York ass. Uh-huh. I knew it was on and popping. Damn. So right now, my mind is thinking, I'm like, yo, I got to get out of this. My whole thing was no disrespect to, to the DC dudes that I have love for, but I said, there's no way in the world to let these bammers kill me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right, I'm from right, New York. Right. I'm slick. Yo, we got talk game. I'm right. getting up out of this situation. So what are you saying, like, why they driving you off, and how how long is that drive? The drive is about, because they kept me in the same area, so the drive is about... Um, I say less than five minutes because okay. they just take me from one street to an alley. Right. Okay. Then to another street. Right. Because they what happened was I get in the car, I hear the guns click back, so I reach up, I look, they put the gun in my face. I'm like, oh man, we got you. So I'm like, you got me. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got all the money, the drugs, this and that. So I'm like, oh man. So they drove me to this alley, and the day before everything happened, I had ran into this guy that I knew that was. Happened to be part of the trio. Okay. And when he saw me, you know, I got on gators. I got on, you know, mm-hmm. typical drug look. Right. So he says to me, he says, New York, your name is ringing bells out here, man. You're doing good. Mm-hmm. I said, ah, I downplay. I said, ah, ain't nothing nobody can do if they don't put the work in. It's, right. You know, just got to put the work in. You'll come up. You know what I mean? Right. And I, and I, and I just, just, just kept it moving. Right. He was one of the three guys oh, that man. they picked up. <laughs> In the uh-huh. car. Right. And he actually happened to put a gun to my head. But see, the whole thing was God was giving me a warning. Right. I just ain't pay attention to I it always because I was moving too fast. Right. I always he was that. warning me. Yes. You always get a warning. Right. He was warning me. But me thinking that I'm moving through the trenches, I'm so slick. Right. Little did I know, they just was lining me up. Right, right. So he gets, I guess he gets in the car, he's sweating. So when he's sweating, he got the gun in my head. I said, this is the guy I'm going to work on. Mm-hmm. The other two dudes already looking like, we already know what we're going to do to you. Right. But he's sweating, so he's the scared one. Right. So I'm like, yo, I just saw you in the morning. Yo, blah, blah, blah. We had a conversation. He was like, yo, yo, L, New York, you know, just cooperate. Mm. So I said, I got this dude. Mm-hmm. And I just played on his emotions. Like, right. yo... 
Y'all got me. You know what I'm saying? You can shoot me in the leg one time. It's part of the game. Yo, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> you negotiate. You know, yeah, I'm negotiating my life. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm That's saying? That's crazy. I'm negotiating my life. Right. So, um, because they had no mask on or okay. no gloves. So I already right. knew they was trying to end me. Right. They take me to another alley. Um, they pull me out the car. I'm still talking. You know, I'm like, yo, it is what it is. Bop, bop, bop. So it was a building. I don't know if they busted a hole out. It was a concrete wall to a building. It was a big hole in the building. Right. I don't know if they um, put the hole in there or from, from the building being old, it just right. had a hole in there. Right. But they told me with the gun in my head, go inside that hole. I said, I ain't going inside that hole. Right. Y'all going to kill me right here. Right. Because I knew for sure right. if I go in that hole. Nobody going to find you. Not only are they going <laughs> to find me, I didn't want my kids to know that I got killed in the alley. Right. right. So that was what's most important to me. Right. Okay, you can kill me, right. but you ain't going to kill me in that manner. Right. You, you understand what I'm right. saying? So um, I refused to go in there, and that's when the table started turning. Because I guess they figured, being that they put the guns on me, I was just going, oh my God, and do everything that they say do. Right. But brother, let me tell you, if somebody got a gun to you, and it's between you and living, right. you're not going to do everything they say you're going to do. Right. You, you know want, what I'm saying? You want your life. You want your life. Right. You know what I'm saying? And at that point, you ain't got nothing to lose. That's right. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Right. So um, we in, we in the alley. Um, they see that I'm not, I'm not cooperating. cooperating with their demands. So uh, I'm like, yo, I got to get up out of here. Mm-hmm. So what happened was... They messed around from us tussling here and there. Mm-hmm. They messed around, had let me have my back to the street with they back to the gate. Right. At first, my back was to the gate. Mm-hmm. Miraculously, somehow, I was able to maneuver. Now, I'm looking and I'm saying, hold up. I can't run that way because right. that's the gate. Right. But it's the street this way. Right. God sent me an angel. I started hearing footsteps. Like somebody walking on gravel. Mm-hmm. And it was like, to me, you know, it's funny now, it was like a cartoon. Mm-hmm. Everybody just stopped and looked. Right. And when I seen that, I couldn't see who it was, but I just seen under the street light a silhouette of a female. Uh-huh. And once I seen that, I said, somebody see what's going on. Right. It's time for me to break. Right. And when I broke, I ran past a dude mm-hmm. and he shot me in my leg. Mm-hmm. So I said to myself, if I keep running, I know they're going to air me out. So I, when he shot me in my leg, I ran and I played dead. Mm. I fell down and played dead. Yo, you a smart dude under pressure, man. Yeah. <laughs> so when he shot me, I ran past him and the guy said, shoot him in his leg. So they shot me in my leg. Mm-hmm. So when they shot me, I said, if I keep running, they probably going to keep shooting me in the back. Right. So I dove down like I was dead right. and I shook in the whole nine yards. Wow. And I laid there and I heard them all run. Mm-hmm. So I said, damn, they just shot me one time. Right. I hear another dude coming back with the same footstep. Shh, shh, shh. But as he's walking up, I'm hearing, pow. And he's hitting me. He shot me four more times. Wow. In my back. Mm-hmm. Now, it's dark. It's like two in the morning. Now, my eyes is open. Mm-hmm. He probably think I'm dead. Right. I'm looking him in his face. Right. He goes into my pocket. He don't even get the money. That I had. He gets mm-hmm. singles. You know, you keep your main money in right. one pocket. Right. You keep your singles in another pocket because right. you don't want to go to the store and just pull out your old knot. Right. So he goes in the pocket and takes the pocket with the singles. So in my mind, I'm saying, damn, you shot me five times. I would have gave you that little two, two or three hours with the singles. Mm-hmm. You didn't even get the little four or five thousand dollars that I had in my left pocket. Right. And he ran and um, I said to God, I said, um, I've never killed nobody and I know what I'm doing is wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, I want you to help me. I don't want my kids to know I died in the alley. And I heard a voice say, if you want to live, get up. And I got up with five shots of me, and I walked down the block. Mm-hmm. And as I was walking down the block, somebody must have called shots in the area. Right. Ambulance is coming down the block right. with no sirens on. <clears throat> Excuse me. I guess trying to hear if they could hear some more shots. Right. Hey, I'm coming, walking down the street. And they take me, no, before they take me to the hospital, they got me laying on the ground. Mm -hmm. Police come and everything. So back in the days, the paramedics in D.C., some of them, I'm not speaking for all of them, but a lot of them will let you die if they knew you was a drug dealer. Right. So they could rob you 
for your jewelry and rob you for your money. Wow. So I'm laying on the ground. I'm in shock, but you still hear what's going on. Right. So I'm laying on the ground. So they're not touching me. So I can't speak, but I'm like, yo, what's going on mm-hmm. in my mind? Right. So I never forget, a white guy pulls up. I guess he's a supervisor of the paramedics, and he mm-hmm. asks them, what's the prognosis? And they say, multiple GSWs. That's multiple gunshot wounds. Right. So they said, does he have a pulse? And they say, Yes. So he says he has he has a pulse. They said, "Well, why are you not working on him?" Right. They said, "Oh, we didn't want to rip his clothes because I had on a Jordan jersey, Versace jeans, mm. but that was his excuse right. to let me die, right. so they could take my money and my jewelry because right. the, the guys who shot me never took my jewelry. Okay, I had a Rolex on, and they didn't get the money. The and they money. didn't get the money. Wow. So they was trying to wait, let me die, so they could rob me." So once he find out that I'm still breathing, he says, yo, work on this guy before he dies. Dang. Everything went. Right. If one thing would have been out of line, I wouldn't be here today. So I remember they take me into the ambulance. And once I get in the ambulance, I said, I'm going to make it. My whole mindset was, I'm Stay not dying. Positive. That's I'm not dying. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Now, yeah. I probably would have, I would have died if I had to walk to the hospital. Right. But I was willing to walk to the hospital. Right. Because I, I had my scruples. Right. I was in little pain, but I kind of knew what was going on. Right. And they took me to Amblam's and um they bring me to the hospital. So it was a grandma figure. She comes to prep me because they about to bring me in surgery and stuff. Mm-hmm. So they bring in two other guys who got shot. The same night. <laughs> same night. Two Jeez. other guys got shot, but they got shot one time apiece. Mm-hmm. So I felt when they had me on a little metal table and they was putting their fingers in my Wounds trying to get the bullet holes, no, right. the bullets out. Right. I was good, but the other two guys, they was in crazy pain. Right. So I was, I had yelled over to him. I said, "Yo, y'all gotta let the doctors work on y'all. We here. We gonna be all right. right. Just relax." Right. And they were screaming and hollering. I go through surgery. Everything good. I'm in surgery for nine hours. I come out. So the doctors is calling me Miracle Child. Mm-hmm. So I'm like Miracle Child. Right. What you mean, Miracle Child? He said, you remember the two guys that came in the hospital with you that got shot? Not with me, but at the same time? Right. I said, yeah, both of them died. They only had one shot. You got shot five times and you lived. So wow. it's a reason why you live. Right. And you have to change your life. Mm. You know what I mean? But to me, once you're in the drug game, your whole sense of thinking is, 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 is tilted. Because my day out the hospital, I went to get my money that people owed me. Mm. You know what is, I mean? is it is it is it is it when you make that kind of money, is it like a drug? It's a drug. You're addicted. You're uh-huh. just as addictive as the person that's smoking it. Right. You know what I mean? You're just as addicted because it's a high. Right. You know what I mean? The 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 the, the sale, you know, the, the money, you don't know what you're gonna get every sale, so it's just a high. Right. So you're just as bad as the person that's smoking it. All right, so you get out, you get out. Are you are you able to physically go and get your money, or no, are you I'm telling on, them to come get, think, give me I my think, money? I think I got a. If I'm mistaken, I think I remember. I think I got a crutch. Okay. Hey, game on. I'm, hey, I went right back in the same area where I got shot at, mm. with no pistol. I'm going to get that ten thousand dollars this dude got for me. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Let me get my money. We'll deal with the other stuff later. Okay. And that's when I knew. Um, after you know, years passed and going over my life, I knew that I had a problem with hustling. That it, it just totally took over my, my my mindset because that money just had me just going crazy. Right. You know what I mean. Right. And anytime you put your life on the line for a dollar, something wrong with you, man. Right. And it happens every day. Yeah. So, what happens then? Um, I stay I stay in D.C. I think for another six months to a year. By then, you know, I don't got shot up. You know, your mind is is crazy. You you still trying to hustle, but you like, yo, this ain't for me. Whatever happened to the dudes that shot you? Did they go in hiding? You know? Well, the dudes who shot me kind of got a go pass because even though they never got justice done. Mm-hmm. I had people that loved me in D.C. that wanted to go do harm to their family. Right. But being that 
my heart was never that way. Right. I couldn't condone. I understand. Their mother, or their sister, or their brother. Right. Getting hurt behind something that I knew that I was doing was wrong. Right. So I kind of took it like a loss. Right. You know what I mean? Charge it to the game. I charged it to the game, but I knew I was done with DC. Okay. I had an uncle that lived in Virginia, right across the water. He was getting high. I didn't know he was getting high like that. Mm -hmm. So he convinced me. Why he got me a job? So he convinced me, yo, this is new territory for you over here. And I picked up hustling again in Virginia. This is crazy because I have friends, and it's like known for some reason. New Yorkers always get caught up in Virginia, and they have the yeah. worst laws. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I went, I go to Virginia. Everything is smooth. I felt as long as I wasn't selling weight, and I pieced people off, people off. I was good. Right. But some other dudes from Virginia got caught, and once they mentioned New York with crack, and of course they put me. At another level, kingpin status, level, right? level of <laughs> bagging me, it was just it was eighteen months. I was I was locked up. You was locked up eighteen months. Yes, and so how was it when they came to get you? Did you well, record all that stuff? How well, that? what happened was when they initially raided the part of Virginia. I was in Arlington, Virginia. When they initially initially raided Virginia, I wasn't there. Okay, they caught. The people that I brung from New York down, mm -hmm. they caught a few of them. Mm -hmm. And of course, it led right back to me. Even though they already knew who I was anyway, right. it wasn't like they didn't know who I was. Right. It's just that I didn't get caught at that day. Right. So I stayed on a run for about a year, came to New York. I had no choice but to hustle then. Right. I'm hustling by Sylvia's. <laughs> God tell me, yo, don't come out on Sunday. Got to respect the block. What I do, I come out on Sunday. What I do, I get locked up. Mm. But being that I've never been locked up in New York before, I gave him a fake name. Mm -hmm. I made it out, person with cognizance. Right. Two days later, the U.S. Marshals was at the address that I gave because I was living around the corner from Sylvia. So okay. two days later, U.S. Marshals was dead. So they was kind of like hot on my trail. And and um, I don't know if anybody, well, I'm quite sure a lot of people have been in a situation. You got a choice but to hustle now. Right. So my whole thing was, I normally get locked up one day, but not leaving a lot of charges that I'm gonna have to answer to because I'm going from here to here to here. Right. So I wound up going to Co-op City. My cousin let me stay at his house. What I do, start hustling there. <laughs> but I didn't catch a charge. Some dudes got whiffed that I was hustling in Co-op City and they shot the uh, door up. Mm. So now I gotta explain to my cousin, like, yo, of course I ain't tell him I was hustling. I just said, yo, they shot the door up. So I wound up back in DC. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to do the right thing because at that time, the uh, feds hadn't raided my house in D.C. where my kid's mother was. Right. So I figured I was cool. Right. Uh, I go back. I'm working. Um, my mistake was I tried to get a Federal Express job. Uh. And once I used my right social, I guess it pinged the system. Mm. And eventually, they ran upon me and got me. Mm. And they took me from D.C. and uh, to Virginia, and they said, "Well, you know, we can take you to DC, and we'll extradite you back to Virginia." I said, "Man, just take me to Virginia, man, because I already knew it was me." And I just said to myself that um, at this particular time, I'm tired. Mm -hmm. Hey, I know I'm going to jail. Now this is going to be the time where I'm gonna recondition my mind. So the day I do get out, I'm gonna be totally different than what I was when I went inside. Mm. So you were just tired of running. Tired of running. Tired of running. Yeah. Tired of the lifestyle. Yeah, because every time you hear a siren, you go into panic mode. Yeah. It's not comfortable. If you're living under pressure. Yes. Yes. Paranoid. I, I can't time. get pulled over. I mean, by then I had fake license and all that, but how long that was gonna last? Right. I mean, and a few times I did get did, did get stopped mm -hmm. with a license. That's why I say I always say black people look alike. Right. <laughs> I, I was having somebody else's license. Right. And when they, when I get pulled over, I, I give them that. And I was getting old, getting away, but right. how much longer was that going to happen? Right. So they sentenced you where in Virginia? Yeah, sentenced me in yeah in Virginia. And how long? How long you do? I did ten years. They ten sent years. Yeah, ten wow. years. Yes. Straight. I, straight. I did actually did like nine months. I mean, nine years and like eleven months, eleven something months. like that. Oh, yeah. That's nine. I would have did more time. But Obama had passed the crack law in 2011. Wow. And the first day that it came into effect, 
it kicked me right out of jail. I ain't had to go to no halfway house or nothing. Wow. Yes. So so what did you do with that time in jail? We conditioned your mind and all that. This was what led you to what we're here for right now was the barber No question. Industry. Um, I remember they bring me to um, Alexandria Detention Center. That's where they hold all the federal uh, uh, commits. Yes. Virginia. They bring me there. So I'm sitting in my cell, and I'm like, man, you're going to do a long time. I, well, what you going to do to survive mm -hmm. in jail and what you going to do once you get out of jail? Right. And I said, well, I don't want to sell drugs no more, so that's out the question. Right. Um, I started asking different people that have been in the federal system, what type of jobs do they have in the federal system? They said, like, oh, you can work in laundry. I said, well, nah, I'm not going to work in laundry when I get home. Right. Oh, you can work in the kitchen. I said, no, I'm not going to be washing pots when I get home. So one guy said, well, you can work in the barbershop. Mm -hmm. And the light bulb went off, and I said, barbershop. Every time I go to the barbershop, it's just like hustling. Mm -hmm. You provide a service, hands, money switch hands, he's smiling, you smiling, right. y'all go about your own way. Right. So I said, yo, I might have to follow this. Now, before I got um, shot, I attempted to go to barber school because I was trying to get an exit out mm -hmm. of this life that I had uh, put in front of me. Right. I was tired of it years before I even went to jail. Right. But I said, well, I got to do something else. So I actually did go to barber school, but that didn't last because every time somebody hit me for some work, I was gone. Right. Then I wound up getting shot. So that kind of just stopped the whole me going to barber school. So I said, you know what? I could pick up teaching myself how to cut hair again. And if I carry it the same way, I did when I hustled. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be all right. Right. I go on my cell. I get my pen and paper. Back then, to say uh, arguments say cuts was fifteen dollars. I just said, well, if I get to the shop to say eight o'clock, I work to just say six o'clock. Um, you probably can cut. I'm talking to people, so right. I, I'm asking all types of questions. Right. You know, they, they were saying the average you can cut two to three heads an hour. So I'm doing the math. Right. So at the end of the week, I'm saying, whoa. No, it's, it's some money in barbering. Right. So now I already got the business sense kind of mm -hmm. embedded in me. Right. Now I just got to learn how to be a barber. Okay. So I'm in the county. So one of the um, barbers was going home that was on some misdemeanor time. Mm -hmm. So they said, the, 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 um, the trusty lady came in the unit and said, does anybody know how to cut hair? And I said, I do. <laughs> and I ain't know how to cut a lick. <laughs> I said, I do. Right. So I go inside and um, started chopping people up. Mm. I figure, hey, you ain't going nowhere. Right. Hey, worse is worse, you're going to court. So that was my beginning of learning how to cut hair. Right. And I'm going to tell you, even back then, it was very, very interesting because even now that I'm a professional barber, you never know who you're going to run into. You right. never know who you're going to cut. Right. Back then in the county... I cut it, the first Taliban soldier, John Walker Lynn. Wow. I cut him. I said, my grandkids ain't going to believe that I'm cutting you. <laughs> because one, one night, they um, bring me out my cell, two in the morning. And I said, y'all want me to cut somebody two in the morning? Mm -hmm. In my mind, I said, this must be somebody really, really important. Mm -hmm. Little do I know, I'm in there cutting his hair. And I said, you getting a haircut two in the morning? So he's not really talking. So I said, um... What's your name? And he says, John. Me with my sense, I said, John Walker Lynn? And he says, yeah. I said, they ain't going to believe this shit here. I'm cutting the first American Taliban. Wow. Yeah. I seen um, the barbershop wing. They had a separate cell next to the barbershop wing. Are you familiar with Zachary Masawi? He's the 14th suspected hijacker who never made it on the plane. He was from France. Wow. Ooh, I, got to, I got to see... And talk to him through, you know, through the cell, through the right. cell door. Right. So you know, you was running to um, some interesting people. I ran into a guy who got uh, convicted for life for being a Soviet uh, American spy for the Soviets. I mean, it was crazy, you know. And even um, now, I'm, I'm a professional barber. Mm -hmm. The different people that I rub shoulders with, I never thought I would ever, ever run rub shoulders with. Right. So let's go through it. Now, when you're in jail and you start the barbering, do they have someone training you or did you have to be, did you just learn as you went on? Well, 
what the first spot I went to, they had a um, barber program, but it went by how many years you had remaining on your sentence. Okay. So being that I already came in with a high number, that kind of put me at the bottom of the list. Okay. And to and to my luck, when I was eligible, the system was cutting back. Because of budget cuts, they uh, cut the pro the program out. Yeah. So now, I said, you know what? When one door closed, one door open. Right. We got commissary where you go buy different items for you while you right while you locked up. Right. So they had these little beard trimmers that you would just groom yourself. Mm-hmm. So I said, you know what I could do? Let me buy a pair of those mm-hmm. and just practice. Right. And I went around. And I just would cut people for free. I would invest my own buy my own batteries. And I said, listen, let me just cut your hair. Mm-hmm. This is what I'm going to do when I get out. So I need as much practice as possible. So for the next eight, nine years, every facility I went to, man, I just kept practicing. So in my mind, I said, I'm not locked up. I'm in barber school. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. To keep me mentally right. you know, sane because you can go crazy in there. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? So Wow. That's what kept me positive and focused because I said, yo, if I can cut hair in here with murderers, lifers, mm-hmm. and, 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 and withstand the pressure of, not, of learning and becoming a good barber in this environment, right. when I get out in a more civilized environment, I'm going to be a cold-blooded beast because you won't be able to rattle me. Right. Right. So every step, you know, you have people, who, oh, you a bum, you can't cut. I mean, I, I went through it. I, right. I, I mean, I remember I tell you a story. Um, you're familiar with Sex, Money, and Murder? Yeah. The, the crew from the Here Bronx? From the Bronx, uh-huh. Now, um, um, one of the guys, I can't remember, China was his name. Mm-hmm. He says, New York. I'm in a max uh, facility right now. He says, New York, you, you know how to cut? I said, yeah. He said, I want to shape up. No problem, Spanish do. I shape him up. Bop, 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 bop. He said, Oh, this is nice. Two weeks later, New York. Think you can give me a fade? Shit, I can shape you up. I can fade. Little right. do I know, I don't have no experience with fading. Right. I chop him up. Right. I got to feed him that night because I can't let him look in the mirror because I know I'm doing a bad job. Uh-huh. So they calling the last call for chow. Mm-hmm. I'm like, Nah, I'm going to feed you, man. Just don't worry about it. By that by that time, my trimmer is red hot because right. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get this line out. Right. So I remember this guy from DC. I called him. I said, "Yo, I can't get this line out." Mm-hmm. So he comes. He fixed the cut up. Everything is good. Right. So China says to me, he "says You want to be a barber, right?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "There's no doubt in my mind when you get out that you're gonna be a good barber." By then, I'm down on myself. I'm like, man. Why you say that? He said, mm. because I got life plus 40. Mm. You didn't know that. Mm. What, I was, what if I was going on a visit and I was had to go like this? Mm-hmm. He said, man, man, you have big problems. Right. He said, but I admire your heart. Right. But don't be running around here chopping people up <laughs> and get yourself killed. Yeah, that's, I mean, you know what I'm saying? I can't but, imagine. I've seen some fights go on because right. people were unsatisfied with their, but you in prison. their haircut. So in prison, someone could actually right. say that you could get killed, killed. by jacking somebody's hair off. Yeah, that's a lot yeah. of pressure. He said, what if I was going on a visit? I couldn't go like this. Right. And I can't go on my visit. So that means me and you are going to have problems. Right. So he said to me, if you try that on me, he said, when you go home, they're going to be in trouble wherever you go. He said, right. because... <laughs> You you a beast. Right. <laughs> you, you, you put your life on the line. Right. And I sat in my cell that night and I said, yo, I got to learn this. Right. And every step that I went, I, I made it down all the way down to a low facility. Going to barbershop, you know, barbershop politics. Inmates want me to come through them to get the job. I'm like, I ain't going to y'all. I'm going to the police that run the barbershop. Right. I get into a fight with one, one of the barbers because... Back then, my game was still limited, mm-hmm. but with my with my character and how I relate with people, right. dudes who's let me cut their hair because they was feeling my vision right. that when I get out, right. this is what I want to do. I had the police opening the barbershop early in the morning before breakfast and let me go inside right. because they believed in my 
dream yeah. when I said I'm going to be a barber. Right. So everything happened the way it's supposed to happen. Right. All right. So you do your nine years, nine months, and now you're coming out. How do you make your way to levels? How long you been at levels? I've been in levels uh, this November, make eight years. Eight years. So tell me about your transition to coming home. Well, when I came home, um, I knew I wanted to be a barber. Mm -hmm. I didn't want no job. I wanted to be a barber. Because this is what I've been doing while I was incarcerated. So right. what happened was um, my younger brother, he knew somebody who had a barber shop in Bushwick. And um, I was supposed to go in there. But when I went there, the chair was broke. Mm -hmm. And um, it didn't look like he was trying to get a chair. So I was so desperate to become a barber and start my, um, my career in barbering, I was willing to purchase the chair mm -hmm. myself. Right. This way I could start. And um, what happened was that was the arrangement. That's the ambition. <laughs> yeah, that was the arrangement. So right. I'm going to um, Atlantic Mall because I'm working out downtown Brooklyn, you know, doing my exercise and stuff. Mm -hmm. So... I wear glasses, as you see, and this particular day, I didn't wear my glasses. Mm -hmm. So when I get off the bus on Fulton, I get off on Fulton and Washington instead of getting off on Fulton and Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. So when I get off, I walk by two shops. It was a shop of four levels, and then it was levels. Mm -hmm. When I was in prison, I already had seen levels in a black man magazine. Mm -hmm. In an article that the particular individual, individual wrote up, it was fitting what I was thinking Barber was going to be when I get out. He right. said he was making 100000 plus. He was cutting uh, professionals, you know, mm -hmm. and I always knew about levels. Right. I just didn't think I was that good to get inside levels. Right. So um, when I walk past, I see levels. It was quiet. Mm -hmm. uh, you was cutting. Right. And it was maybe one or two people in the back. me and six, I think. Right, was cutting. So mm -hmm. I come inside, so I said, hey, um, I just want to know what type of equipment you have because right. I'm about to work in Bushwick and I know that y'all are a good upstanding shop right. and y'all working with the best of the best. So just give me right. what I need to get because right. at this particular time, I need to go get my equipment. Right. Me and you started talking and one thing I respect about you, you never told me you was the owner. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. And I, I really dug that once I found out you was the owner. Mm -hmm. And you told me, um, oh, Oh, yeah? You, you're going to work in another barbershop? So one word led to another, and mm -hmm. I told you right then, I said, yo, i am got to be honest with you. I just came home two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I said, but I'm, I'm, I'm a good dude. I said, you can trust me. I said, and um, if you give me this job here, I'm going to be an asset to your business, mm -hmm. and I won't, you know, I won't do you wrong. Right. And um, one word led to another, and you gave me a card to go to um, the shop on, shop on the east side. Yeah, that's where we do the interviews. Right, and you told me, um, <laughs> go you, get your equipment, Yeah, go up there Monday, you're going to cut the homeless, and, right. and I went up there Monday, and I'm cutting the homeless, and then you walk in, and the guy said, oh, that's the owner, and I was like, word, I said, oh, he cool. Right. He never, you know, right. bloated that this was his establishment, right. and it's, it's just been beautiful, you know, ever and, since then. And you know what's uh, interesting, because... Um, you fill out an application, and on the application, you have to put references, right? right? And um, everybody gave you like these outstanding references. Right. It was, it was like I never like received that kind of, uh, you know, references from right. somebody. You know, people was putting a stamp on your name, right? And um, you know, so I gave you the job. I don't even remember how well the cut was. I don't, and and well, yeah, I look for people and personality. More than cut because of cutting, you can get right. You know what I mean. But your behavior, you know, that stands out more. Your personality and behavior stands out more than your talent or lack of talent. Right. It's a it's a skilled trade. You if you work at it, you'll get better. So if someone's personality to me and behavior is more important than their skill level on the entry. So you passed all of that. Right. And um, it was fortunate that you was able at that time the shop that was down the block is a group of guys who all left, quit, and went down the block and opened up a shop. Right. So, you know, it was a tough time. You know, when you came, it was just me, you, and Denarvo, and Six. Right. You know what I mean? Then later on, Jay came, but you had an opportunity to work with me. Right. But not everybody gets that opportunity. Right. You got the opportunity to see how I am, see how I run my business. Right. And one thing I will say, all the advice that I ever gave you 
you applied it. Right. You know, and I, I watch other people, they've been around me twice as long as you, and they still don't get it. You know what I'm saying? Right. If someone's successful, you copy what they're doing, Dude, exactly. and then you branch off and do your own thing. And these guys, everything that I told you to do, you did, and more. Right. And then you you had your other skills and, and, and things that you brought to the table, and I always use you as a prime example of what it is to be a great barber and how far you can go in this industry. And people think that they can't make it off of this industry. And I'm like, no, you can. It's just the way you apply, apply yourself. yourself. And um, you you came with the slogan, if you don't like it, you don't pay, which I love. And I, I want that slogan to be level slogan, <laughs> right, honestly. Right. You can have you it. Know? <laughs> and, uh, but I just, you know, it's the reception that I'll get back from the guys. You know, but I, I believe if someone is, isn't happy with the service, they shouldn't have okay, to pay. Right, right. You know, so I stand behind that 100%. But... You know, so that's you know where I come in. But tell people, you know, what you what you've learned over the years, and where you know where you are in life as a barber, right. how you change it, change your whole life around. Right. And I would just say that he's a very successful barber. You know, so I'm a. Pass it back to you. I just wanted to say that. Well, in the beginning, like you said, everything that you told me is one thing I laugh at. You told me, and I was like, cards, cards ain't gonna work. But oh well, let me try it anyway. Right. Because you successful. Right. And it works. Mm -hmm. And speaking of the cards, I've been at levels eight years. I don't hand it out over or close to forty thousand cards. Yeah. You'll never catch me without no cards. I right. got cards everywhere. Y'all hear that, Barbers? You hear that? And I still cut <laughs> a lot of people, but if I'm not cutting, instead of sitting in the shop, I still go back outside and I still hand out cards. You got to do the same thing and it got you where you at. Right. Oh, don't, get, don't fall in love with success. Fall in love with the process that got you there. And I should tell people how if you wasn't cutting and it was cars at the light, you would go up to the car. Oh, no doubt. And give your car. They roll down the window, window. and you yes. give them your car but and tell you, them, you don't like it, you, you don't, don't pay. But this is the whole thing. <laughs> Everything that I have I have did, I've mirrored behind levels. Like if I'm giving out cards, I got my levels jacket on. Mm -hmm. Because if you just walk them to a car in New York City, they don't know what you ask. They can right. think you ask them for money. Right. So whatever I did to to have people relax, I always did it. Barber first, then me. Mm -hmm. Levels, then me. Right. I never just tried to do me because Levels is a known brand. Mm -hmm. Why would I work against the brand? Right. I'm a. If I got to put on, I used to put on. People would laugh at me. Used to have a sign that go around your neck with the two um, yeah. uh, 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 billboards in back right. and front. Right. I would walk up and down the street and just hand out cards because it's a recognizable brand. Right. My whole thing is. You could be successful, but it's just the work that you put in. Some right. people want to come to the shop for two hours, and then they're going to cut a lot of people. No, right. you got to sit there, and it's consistency. I've been at Levels almost eight years. I haven't missed one day except mm -hmm. going on vacation. Right. You know, this is what I do. This is what I love. And um, it'll treat, if you treat the game good, it's going to treat you good. Um, your dress code, I try to stay looking nice. Right. Because if you a person look at you as if you're going to take care of yourself, you definitely going to take care of them. Right. I don't smoke. You know, and even if you do smoke, you can't have the people smelling the smoke right. while you grooming them. Right. You know, you can't have on, you can't have certain music. Can you, right, you can't, you can't have, you can't have um, certain. It won't pick up that. You can let it oh, buzz. Okay. Yeah. It, it, you can't have uh, certain music on when kids or older women. Mm -hmm. Or in the shop. You, right. know, you, you just got to be a straight professional, whatever you do. Right. And this grind, you got to want to um, be good. Like, I watch your videos on YouTube, how to do the Afro. I watch, you know, I give myself a refresher course. I'm always barbering. I'm watching people cuts on the street. I mean, you got to want to be good. That's why the slogan, if you don't like it, you don't pay. It forces me to give you a good cut. Right. Tell them what time you come in every day. Um, I come in between 5 to 6 a.m. Every day. Every day. So all you barbers out there who feel that you're not making it in the industry, are you coming in at 5 o'clock? Are you coming in at 6 o'clock? You know, it's it's on you 
And this man stays booked up all day. And he still leaves at the normal time that mostly everybody else leaves at 7, 8, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. And, and mind you, the shop is not due to be open until 10, but I can't stop someone that passionate. I mean, he has so much clientele now that it trickles over to everyone else. And that's when someone complains about, oh, this person is giving out cards. I say he's not only promoting for himself, he's promoting for you too because there's going to come a time when he can't cut everybody. It's only so many hours in a day and you're going to eat off of just standing next to him. And I'm like, if he comes in at five, okay, why don't you come in at eight, you know? But they, they just don't get it, you know? And I mean, you're like the model barber. That if I if I would tell, wanted to tell Barbara, you want to be successful, go go work next to Lonnie and do everything he does. I mean, if these dudes did seventy percent of what you do, they would be in, in such a better position. Yeah, you know. See, because along with um, being consistent, you build up a relationship with the people you cut, and, right. and you kind of become part of their family. Of course. So. They're going to show you love. They're going to mm-hmm. be there for you. All you got to do is be where you're supposed to be. Right. And sometimes you got to bend a little. And clients become friends and yes. family. Yes. They really do. The word know. spreads. Uh, people refer you to people. And Now, so who's some of your clientele from the hard work you put in? Um, I have cut, um, God bless the dead, Ken Thompson. He was the Brooklyn DA. Mm-hmm. He was coming with his full entourage Yes. when I was cutting his hair. Um Ex NBA player Jim Jackson. Every time he comes to New York, he comes to the shop. Um, sometimes he can't make it. I go to the Fifth Avenue to his hotel in the city. Mm-hmm. Um, my man Lucius Fox that plays on Gotham. I cut one of the ladies that was a soldier in um, Black Panther. Um, Hakeem Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, Assemblyman mm-hmm. Walter Mosley, and countless un- other individuals that have good titles, but just not out into the right. world like that. I got lawyers, doctors. I got a young black professionals. Right. So we're going to wrap it up. Are you, your, your early story was longer than your success story, <laughs> right. but we're going to make those match over right. time. Right. Um, what advice would you give a barber, young barber starting in the industry? Um, first, you want to get your craft. You want to get your craft in order. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about the money. The money going to come. You want to be the best barber and give the best cut that you can give and continuously want to grow with your cut. The money going to follow you, but never lose the love of wanting to give out good work and right. being professional and being consistent. Yes. You know what I mean? It's not going to happen overnight. It didn't happen for me overnight. Right. Consistency, Consistency and persistence yes. beats over talent all the time. Yes. All the time. Yes. <laughs> And just and just wanting to be a good barber, but right. you got to change everything. You you can't be a good barber, but you come to work late. You can't be a good barber, but you smell like weed. You can't be a good barber, and 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 you're not dressing appropriate, right? Because you're dealing with professional people, mm-hmm. so you got to play the part. I'm not saying that you got to wear Gucci and this and that, but you got to throw a button up on, throw some soft shoes on. You got to show that you're worthy of these this money and these tips they're giving you, right? Because if you're not dressing yourself to a certain degree, they're going to give you anything. Mm, dress for success. You got to dress it. for success. Yes. So, uh, tell the people in Barber World, you know, or clients, anybody watching, how they can reach you. Um. You can hit me at 347-435-6534. You can go on the Levels, Levels Le, uh, website. You can call me at uh, Levels Barbershop, 718-398-8122. Or you can just simply just stop by. I, I sit in the back right in front of the TV. And the address? Just it's so 915 that. Fulton Street, Brooklyn, New York, Clinton Hills. Edward Scissorhands, your man. All right. Well, thank you for coming by, brother. It's been a pleasure, man. Appreciate you yes. sharing your story. Yes. In closing, love is love, life is life, loyalty is priceless. Be the best barber you could be. Peace. Peace.